Well, welcome to the August 2017 Nutritionist webinar. I'm Marianne Fessenden from AMTS and your English language host. These webinars provide access to technical seminars by internationally recognized speakers. This month, I am joined by Paula Torillo from Argentina. She will be hosting the Spanish language seminar. We do not have any Brazilians joining us this month. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit questions through me or Paula. A complete recording of archived webinars as well as a question and answer session for each will be available on the AMTS website. We are very happy to ho this month to host Dr. Christian Kroiwagen, an emeritus professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at Stellenbosch University, South Africa. After working for the Department of Agriculture as a research scientist for 21 years, he joined the Stellenbosch University in 1996. His research focuses on the nutrition of dairy cattle and calves, and he has 116 scientific and popular articles to his credit. Croy Wagen is a member and past president of the South African Society of Animal Science and a member of the American Dairy Science Association. He is also a former chair of the Agricultural Microscopy Division of the American Oil Chemist Society. Awards include the South African Society for Animal Science Bronze Medal in 1987, the Animal Feed Manufacturers Association Technical Person of the Year in 2009, Western Cape Provinces Agriculturalist Agriculturist of the Year 2009, and the Stellenbosch University Rector's Award for Research Excellence in 2010. His talk today will be on challenges to maintain healthy rumen pH in dairy cows. Chris John, thank you for joining us. Um, we appreciate you taking this time to work with us. It's evening in South Africa for you, isn't it? That's right. And hello to everyone that's listening in. First of all, I would like to thank AMTS for the invitation. It is really an honor for me to be part of this webinar series. Okay. Now, the topic is quite wide because there are so many factors that affect rumen pH. I have thus decided to structure my presentation as follows. Rumen pH is important for obvious reasons and I will give you a little background on that. I'll touch a bit on metabolic disorders and I'll spend quite a bit of time on factors that affect rumen pH. That is feed factors, cow factors, environmental factors, management factors and so on. And then before concluding I would like to touch on some recent research that we did at Stellenbosch University. Now, rumen pH is important for various and obvious reasons. We are usually interested in pH variations and researchers report maximum pH, minimum pH, average pH, diurnal profiles, and time spent below a certain pH. Now, when I prepared my presentation, I was in a bit of a conflict with myself whether I should add a little discussion on the next few slides, but because it is actually about pH, I thought it could be of interest to discuss a few basic concepts of pH. pH is defined as a decimal logarithm of the reciprocal of the hydrogen ion activity in a solution. Now, biological cells do not react to pH, but they react to proton concentrations. And rumen microbes are continuously surrounded by a variety of ions and they use different biochemical pathways to mediate the transport of ions across the cell membrane or to fend them off. Okay, pH and pH measurement. pH now. Okay, so the average pH values are often reported and the question arises whether we should calculate averages on the pH values or on the hydrogen ion values. So if we look at this slide, it is a diurnal profile from one of our trials, and in this case, the pH was around 6 early in the morning. Then it gradually dropped off during the course of the day. It reached the nadir of 5.46 late at night, and then it gradually started to increase again um, up to the morning feeding. That you see here 
is a pH based on the arithmetic, arithmetic average just of the pH values. In the second case, the pH values were first converted to their antilog values. The proton concentrations were then averaged and the negative antilog was recalculated. But using all the data, we saw that the average of the pH was 5.66 and based on the iron concentration of hydrogen it was 5.63. So that's not so much of a difference. With a small number of data that vary over a wide range, the different methods may result in differences. For example, if we take pH values of 6.5, 6.4, 6.3, 6255 and 54 then the average calculated as the arithmetic value of the pH was 6.05 but when we based it on the hydrogen ion concentration it was 5.82 now in this case you know, there's quite a significant difference between these two values however with continuous logging over 24 hours the differences might not be that obviously so what I want to say is that when one is interested in the average or mean pH values, one should just be aware that the different approaches may yield somewhat different results. And I would like to hear some comments from, from people out there. Mostly, however, we are interested in the pH profile and not very much in the average pH. And in cases where pH declines far below 6, we definitely want to look at the duration of the pH below 5.8 or 5.5. To the topic, I asked myself a few questions. The first question was, what is a healthy rumen pH? There can be various definitions, but I think a healthy rumen pH is one where the fiber digestion will be maximal and dry matter intake now, is optimal ruminal pH the same thing as a healthy pH? The cellulolytic microbes prefer a pH of roughly 6.2 or above, while amelulytic microbes may also prefer a pH of more than 6. They can still function quite well at pH values below 6. So the lower the rumen pH drops below 6.2, the further the cow moves away from a healthy rumen. So there may be a subtle difference between an optimal rumen pH versus a healthy one. Carbohydrates are usually the first limiting nutrient for microbial growth. However, with high starch diets, the energy is at times not limiting and the rumen microbes may have to adjust their metabolism strategies to cope with excess energy. One strategy is energy spilling. According to Russell et al., many bacteria apparently spill energy to survive and have reactions that dissipate excess ATP when the catabolic rate is faster than the anabolic rate. Take Streptococcus bovis as example. In a continuous culture system at pH 6.7, Ethanol formate and acetate accounted for most of the fermentation product and little lactate was performed, according to Russell and Heine in 1985. When the extracellular pH dropped to 4.7, the intracellular pH decreased to 5.4 and s bofus switched to lactate production. The energy spilling reaction of s bofus is mediated by a futile cycle of protons through the cell membrane, as demonstrated in this little diagram here. Furthermore, according to Shi and Weimer, a low rumen pH has also been shown to increase the maintenance energy cost of ruminal microorganisms with a decrease in microbial cell yield. So too low pHs are not good. It should be noted, however, that a slightly lowered pH would result in more of the f f um, volatile fatty acids to be in a protonated form, which would facilitate absorption via the ruminal epithelium. This could come at the cost of 
slight lower fiber digestion, but an increased energy utilization. The second question that I asked myself was, can a healthy rumen pH be maintained? Now, in cows with a low milk yield of 25 kilograms per day and less, a high forage diet uh, being used, it is not difficult to maintain a healthy rumen pH. Very little concentrates are fed in that case. But the higher the yield, the, yield, the more concentrates the cow is being fed, and the higher the challenge becomes. Due to the high nutrient requirements of high yield in dairy cows, and to manifest their genetic potential, diets are being formulated that very often result in unhealthy rumens. So all in all, it is a matter of balancing all the dietary and all the nutrient factors. This reminds me of a quote by Theophrastus Bombastus von Hohenheim, also known as Paracelsus, who said that nutriment is either food or poison. The dosage makes it poison or remedy. So it's all a matter of balance. And that is why we use sophisticated feed formulation models, such as AMTS, to formulate feed for optimal milk production. Moving away from a healthy human pH results in a variety of metabolic disorders. Now, all the metabolic disorders are not directly related to rumen pH, but many of them are interrelated. For example, cows affected by acidosis are far more prone to laminitis, to displaced abomasum, to milk fever, mastitis, and fatty liver. So all the metabolic disorders became known after we started to feed cows more generously to increase milk yield. Many of these, or most of these disorders were not known 100 or 200 years ago. So now the next question is, why do cows get metabolic disorders? Cows are such marvelous animals that can digest a variety of feedstuffs that are poorly digestible or indigestible to mono, by monogastrics, they can convert, they can digest that and convert it to milk. So why do they get metabolic disorders? Let's look at where it all started, at the evolution of the ruminant. Ruminants appeared in the Eocene era, 38 to 54 million years ago. The early ruminants were small animals, they weighed less than 18 kilograms, and they were probably adapted to forest conditions. They also had no horns. Grazing ruminants evolved much later, as grasslands only appeared in the Miocene period, 18 to 23 million years ago. The first livestock species to be domesticated was the goat. Most other ruminant species were domesticated by 2,500 BC. Now the result of evolution was that the rumen environment has adapted over millions of years to host a diverse and sustainable microbial population that has optimal functionality for fiber fermentation. To put it into perspective, let's put the last 20 million years when the grazing ruminants evolved into a seven and a half month period starting from January 1st up to today, August 9th. Then we see that domestication only appeared two hours ago. Now this arrow should be should actually be here at the beginning of the blue block. So after all this time, the seven and a half months of developing and adaptation and establishment of microbial populations, etc., domestication only occurred two hours ago. But that's not all. We started to feed animals intensively only four minutes ago. So it's a very, very short period ago. There really wasn't time for animals to adapt to what we are feeding them today. So, are we surprised that cows get metabolic disorders? Let's first look a bit at carbohydrate fermentation. Uh, 
the most important end products of carbohydrate fermentation in the rumen are volatile fatty acids and lactic acids. Volatile fatty acids affect the rumen pH, the magnitude of which is determined by their ratios and the presence of lactic acid. Rumen pH affects health, digestibility, microbial protein yield, milk yield, and milk composition. I'm sure most of you have seen a similar slide to this one. And you can see at pH 6.5 to 7, the cellulolytic microbes are happy and effective, and they produce mainly acetic acid. As the pH goes down, be it as a result of more concentrates being fed, or finer particle size, or whatever, but as the pH goes down, acetic acid drops, propionic, and, propionic acid and butyric acid increase, total volatile fatty acids may increase, and the amylolytic bacteria become very active at pHs 6 and below, although, of course, they also uh, digest starches at higher pH levels, but they, they really flourish at this pH, and that is where the challenge starts. So if we feed even more grain and the pH drops further, then at around 5.5, the lactate producers start to flourish, and lactic acid is being produced, which is 10 times more acidic than volatile fatty acids, and we start getting things like subacute or acute rumen acidosis. Next, look at the different factors that um, affect the ruminal pH. There are feed factors. First, that include NDF, ENDF, PENDF. There's particle size, starch content, starch source, starch vitreousness, buffers, and direct fed microbials. NDF first. These are all terms that we are familiar with and encounter in feed formulation. The first one is ANDFOM. Now the A obviously means that heat stable amylase was used in the analysis and after ashing the value is expressed on an organic matter basis. So ANDF is probably the most prominent uh, expression that we use. And another thing, especially in AMTS, if we think NDF, we think ANDFOM. The next term that we often use is UNDF and INDF, which is the undigestible fraction of NDF, which is usually determined after 240 hours in vitro. Previously, uh, INDF was reported uh, most often, but recently we talk more about UNDF, and I think Dave Mertens was one that really pushed for the use of UNDF instead of INDF. Anyway, that is um, a fraction that's, that's quite valuable. Then ENDF or effective NDF is, um, of course, important, as is PENDF of physical effective NDF. So I'm going to talk a lot about PENDF and NDF. Uh, the other values are also often used in AMTS and um, in other programs. Now, according to the NRC 201 guidelines, for early lactation, we should have a minimum of 25% NDF in the diet. The preferred range is 27 to 32%. 19% of the NDF should be from forages. The range there is 18 to 23%, depending on the fermentable carbohydrates in the diet. The NDF from forage can be lower, it can be as low as 15, but only if NDF is increased and NFC is lowered from 44 to 36%. According to Grant, 2010, the fermentable NDF content on as a percentage of NDF should be more than 35. If we look at this little table, you can see that if the minimum NDF from forage decreases, we have to increase the minimum NDF in the diet, and the maximum NFC in the diet has to decrease from 44 to 36 percent. 
NDF alone is not enough. We take a sample to a lab and we get the NDF result. And that only gives us a certain chemical quality of the forage or of the TMR. The NDF should be effective. So that is why PE NDF is important. And for lactating cows, PE NDF should be 21 to 24% of the dry matter. Particle size is another important aspect in dietary factors. To determine particle size, we can use a particle state, particle sep the pen state particle separator, where 2 to 8% of the TMR particles on the upper screen should give a good indication or is, is um, preferred, and there should only be 30 to 50 not only, but there should be 30 to 50% of the particles in the middle screen. Uh, this uh, table, I think, was prepared by Jad Heinrichs, and there you can see that um, for different forages and a TMR, what the fractions should be on the upper sieve, the middle sieve, the lower sieve, and the bottom pan. So these guidelines are quite handy to use when we use the Penn State particle separator. Now, PENDF determinations can be done in various ways. There was an excellent article in 1997 by Dave Mertens who suggested the 1.1 millimeter sieve in a vertical shaker to determine the PE factor. And uh, the PE factor is, can, can, of course, be related to chewing activity in cows. The second way is to determine it via the Penn State particle separator. Now, Young and Beauchemin in 2006 determined the PEF values using two or three screens in the particle separator. And these are the results you can see for different diets. Um, coarse, medium, and fine fractions, that the PE NDF and also the PE factors were much higher and probably over-determined or overestimated when the three screens are used compared to the two screens. Boshamin also pre uh, prepared this interesting slide. They summarized data from 23 documented studies to indicate the relationship between PENDF and rumen pH. Now, this looks like these data points are all over the show. It's like a scatter plot all over the graph. But if you look carefully, you can see that as the PENDF goes down below 15, 14, 13, 12, in, in that area, all the values are below six. Uh, all the pH values would be below six with just a few outliers here. On the other hand, for all the values of PE NDF above 15, the pH was always above six, all these values. So that just shows the, the good relationship between PE NDF and rumen pH. According to Boshamin, the high degree of variation between studies reflected in the graph that we just looked at is caused by other variables that affect rumen pH, for example, starch level and fermentability. So PENDF is extremely important, but it can, the end result on pH can be uh, affected by these variables, the starch level especially and the fermentability. Pasture-based cows present a set of their own problems. So, especially cows graying on less pastures. Some of the challenges for pasture-based cows is dry matter intake, um, especially for cows grazing day and night on lush pastures. We really struggle to get enough dry matter into these cows. And then a low PE NDF is also another problem in very lush pastures. 
in summer pastures uh, and different types of forages or pasture grasses, the PNF can be quite high. But in winter, the lush pastures on irrigation and so on can really present a problem in terms of PENDF. The other thing about pasture cows is that they are very often fed concentrate only twice a day. They're in pasture, they go to the milking parlor, and after milking or during milking, they receive their concentrates. Now, if they are fed three or four kilograms per time or per milking or just after milking uh, twice a day, then it can really have quite a significant effect on their human pH. I just pulled uh, two graphs from studies that we have done. Uh, without going into the, the treatments, I can just say that this was Kukuyu pasture in summer, and the NDF and PNDF was not too much of a problem. And you can see the typical diurnal pH profiles, but pH never went below 6 in this case. So there wasn't really a challenge in this type of pasture, even though the cows got uh, concentrates twice a day, three kilos in the morning and three in the afternoon. However, in this case, it was um, ryegrass pastures in the winter time, irrigated, very lush. And you can see here that in the early morning after feeding, six o'clock after feeding, how the pH dropped way down to 5.8 on the pasture. And then it recovered and the cows got fed concentrates again at three o'clock and the pH went right down to a minimum of 5.7. So it's a, a combination of effects, the PENDF of the pasture and it's the amount of concentrates being fed only twice a day. So how do we overcome NDF and particle size challenges? On pastures, it is especially important to take samples frequently and analyze for NDF, PENDF, and of course all the other chemical analysis that we need. Maybe most of you have seen this guy here on this picture. I think um, this was at Tom's first of one of his first visits to South Africa in 2006, seven, somewhere there. And uh, I took him to one of these pasture-based farms in the Western Cape. Okay. Determine the PENDF. Formulate a diet within the acceptable ranges and also pay attention to starch level and fermentability parameters. Starch and NFC levels, now according to the NRC, AMTS and other recommendations, we should roughly have 20 to 30% starch as a percentage of the dry matter. The maximum should be around 33% depending on the PENDF and the NDF from forages. The NFC as a percentage of dry matter according to Grant, 2010 should be 30 to 43%, and the maximum NFC, according to Bosch, mean around 38%. Fermentable starch as a percentage of starch, according to Grant, should be 83 to 86%, and the fermentable total carbohydrates, 42 to 44%. The optimal NFC content for maximal NDF digestion for any given forage is a function of fermentation pH that reflects PENDF content. There is no clear recommendation pertaining to starch to NDF ratios per se. There are too many other fermentation related factors that can contribute to animal response. So how we overcome starch and NDF challenges? We take PENDF into account when including grains in the diet. We formulate a diet that would result in good rumen mat formation, which is always important. 
adhere to recommended starch and NFC recommendations, take note of fermentable starch and total fermentable carbohydrates, keep grind size in mind as this also affects starch fermentation rate. What about the starch source? Uh, different grains ferment at different rates. Now this diagram was taken from Anderson et al. And it shows, it gives us a clear picture of the starch sources that ferment at a fast rate and those that ferment at a slow rate. Wheat, barley and those cereals ferment fast, while corn and sorghum ferment slower. And of course, um, processing also affects how fast these starch sources ferment. Another thing that we should look at is starch vitreousness. Now the vitreousness refers to the ratio between hard and soft endosperm. Vitreousness not only between grains but also within grains as we'll see just now. With high corn diets the risk of low rumen pH and suppurcate rumen acidosis increase with low Vitreousness. Softer the maize, the higher the chances, or the softer the, uh, the whatever grain we use, the higher the chances of acidosis. Of course, depending on how much we use, and this is discussed later uh, in more detail. Another thing that we can use is buffers. The rumen is well buffered around a pH of 6.4 to 6.8, but below 6.8 zero, the buffering capacity becomes poor. In high yielding dairy cows, the di diets are fed the drive pH well below pH 6. Buffers help to negate a low rumen pH. Now there are true buffers and alkalizers. According to Shaver et al, true buffers prevent a decline in pH, but they do not raise pH above a certain level. On the other hand, Alkalizers neutralize the acidity, but they can also increase the pH markedly. True buffers include sodium bicarbonate, sesquicarbonate, limestone, bentonite, and calcareous marine algae, such as acid buff. Magnesium oxide is an alkalizer and not a true buffer. Sodium bicarbonate and limestone are arguably the most often used buffers. Buffers are also often used in combination for a better effect. Research at Stellenbosch University showed excellent buffering capacities of calcareous marine algae. And I'll show you a few slides on this. Um, in this case, the red line was where we only included 0.15% of a calcareous marine product. And in the white line, it increased to 1.2. And you can see that the, the effect of the more of this product that was included in the diet, the higher the pH profile was. In a, a second trial, we added 0.4% of a calcareous marine algae, which was acid buff, and double the amount, 0.8%, of bicarbonate and then we had a controlled diet. Now this diet was quite acidotic. It was um, a really hot diet and what I want you to look at here is the minimum pH was markedly affected by the buffer. So in the control the minimum pH was much lower than in the buffered diet. And the time spent below pH, that was the most interesting one, was much lower in the buffered diets and very high, almost 14 hours below pH 5.5 in the control diet. And um, this is a nice graph that illustrates it. Maybe some of you have seen this graph. The red area here is the control diet and you can see how low it was in the 15 hours almost that it's spent below 5.5, while for the buffer diet, the, the numbers were only 3 hours and 8 hours.
I'm not going to discuss this whole table. Just want to show that the milk yield was also increased as we included these buffers compared to the control. And the Berean algae had the best result in terms of milk yield, uh, milk fat, and, and so on and so on. And also then in the end, um, the efficiency of milk yield was much better in the buffered, in, in the acid buff uh, diet than in the bicarb or the control diet. So buffers are really useful in dairy cow diets. Then we can also use direct fed microbials in diets. Now there are bacterial and fungal DFMs. Bacterial DFMs include Lactobacillus acidophilus and Pegasphera elsdinii, which has a marked effect on the rumen pH. And I'm sure many of you know this product. Maybe you have used it and it can do a quite good things in terms of rumen pH. Then regarding fungal DFMs, there are three types. There are products that guarantee live yeast cells and based on strains of Saccharomyces. Then there are products that contain strains of Cerevisiae, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and culture extract, but they make no claim of live yeast cells, live cells. Then there are, there are the additives based on Aspergillus orizae fermentation end products, and they also make no claims to live cells. So how do we overcome feed challenges? It's important to formulate feeds according to the guidelines regarding NDF and PENDF, and also note the NDF that should come from fiber. Pay attention to starch and NFC levels and their fermentability. Take PE and F into account when including grains in the diet. Formulate a diet that would result in good rumen mat formation. Keep grind size and vitreousness in mind as these affect starch fermentation. Include buffers in high concentrate diets and consider direct fed microbials. Okay, the second factor that I want to touch on is cow factors. An often used quote states that we don't feed cows, we feed rumen bugs. And that is, of course, very true. There is considerable variation among cows regarding genetic makeup and microbial community. And there are low pH cows and high pH cows in each herd that we see very often. Um, Boshamine presented these graphs at the Florida Ruminant Nutrition Symposium, and it clearly illustrates that in this case, on the same diet, same management, everything the same, this cow had a nice high pH around six, between 6 and 6.5, while in this cow, the pH was usually around 5 and below. So good examples of a high pH and a low pH cow. We've also seen it in some of our trials. The thick blue line is the mean profile of these cows. And these five cows were on the same diet, same management, same conditions, but just look at how the pH varied. Look, look there, for example, um, the pH in this case was six over there and in this cow it was coming down to 5.65 or something so a huge difference between cows on the same diet now paul weimer and his co-workers did an excellent trial on the resilience of bovine rubin bacteria community and um, i want to thank paul for these slides um, he generously uh, sent it to me to, uh, to be used in this presentation. What they did was they took two cows. They removed the rumen contents of these cows and they transferred it to the other cow. So cow A's rumen content was transferred to cow B and the same with cow B was transferred to cow A. 
and then they compared the bacterial community over time with that of the cow prior to the exchange that they did in both cows and the results were just phenomenal. I'm not going to discuss everything here. You can look at it at your leisure later on. But what is important and interesting is that the pre-feeding pH returned to the previous level within one day of the switch. The same happened to the volatile fatty acids. The VFAs returned to the pre-exchange pattern within a day of the exchange. So it didn't matter that they transferred the, the rumen content across these two cows. The conditions just returned to as they were before the trial. Remember, these results demonstrated that cows are able to control their own chemistry. But what is also interesting is that you also get cows with widely differing pH profiles that can have similar rumen bacterial community compositions, as um, demonstrated by Palmonari et al. in 2010. Now, environmental factors are also important. Uh, it can definitely impact on rumen pH, especially during times of heat stress. You are all familiar with the effect of humidity on heat stress, and we can use these tables to see how the temperature humidity index increases as humidity increase. With low temperatures, fairly low temperatures, and high humidity, you can have a high TDI value. did an experiment in the cows, and the, the aim was not to look at the environment. It was a totally different experiment. But we recorded the, the pH of these cows um, on different diets when the environmental temperature was mild, between 26 and 28 degrees centigrade. The following week, we had a heat wave, and temperatures were over 32 degrees. 32 to 34, and you can see how the pH dropped. Let, let me just go back to the previous slide. You can see that the mean pH hovered around 6, more or less. But under the uh, conditions of heat stress or the heat wave, it went down, and it was just above 5.5, mostly, most of the times, way below 6. So temperature has an effect on pH. Why? We'll see just now. If we look at the physiological effects, during heat stress, the uh, respiration rate of cows increase, and um, this results in enhanced carbon dioxide exhalation. That impacts on the bicarbonate to carbon dioxide balance, which should be 20 to 1. The kidney secretes bicarbonate to main the balance, and the reduced bicarbonate, there is a reduced bicarbonate then in the saliva to buffer the rumen. Furthermore, the cow ruminates less, so there's less saliva flowing to the rumen to buffer the rumen content. And apart from that, the cow drools, which also results in less saliva going to the rumen. So it's all accumulating. Um, for more information on that, you can read these articles by Baumgart et al. It's a really excellent explanation of um, the physiological effects of heat stress and how to, uh, how to go about it. So how do we overcome environmental and management challenges? During heat stress, the feed intake decreases. Therefore, we have to increase the energy density of the feed. Fiber has a high um, um, uh, HI, high HI heat increment. Sorry, fiber has a high heat increment relative to concentrate feeds, and um, it has also has a high heat of my. Well, that means a high heat of microbial fermentation. Sorry about struggling, but there. 
And fiber also has a lower partial efficiency of acetate relative to propionate and glucose. Rubin protected fats have a low heat increment relative to acetate, but they have a high efficiency of utilization. Whatever we do, we must maintain a sufficient fiber to maintain rumen health. So that's an ADF of more than 18% and NDF of 28 to 30%. So we must be careful to increase the energy density of the diet without compromising on effective fiber. We um, should increase the protein content of the diet with about 1%. Chop hay in a TMR, use silage, wet feeds, add water to dry diets, use only high quality palatable feeds. The requirement of certain minerals increase, I'm not going to go into that. We can use buffers in diets to support pH and butter fat. Cows eat more in the evenings than in the day. So take that into account, feed more in the evening. Have feed analyzed frequently to ensure that the diet has been formulated and mixed correctly. Ensure that the feed that ends up in the feed bunk is similar to the one formulated. Provide sufficient feed bunk space to all the cows. Provide enough feed to all the cows at all times, but feed out more in the evenings than during the day. Provide shade, cool water, fans, etc. Minimize drastic feed changes that can impair intake. Ensure that the TMR is well mixed to provide consistent intake of a well-balanced diet. Include molasses or intake stimulants or flavorants in the diet to improve palatability. Okay, now I just quickly want to touch on some research that we recently did at Stellenbosch University. The topic of the study was the effect of maize vitreousness and a starch binder on in vitro fermentation parameters and starch digestibility in dairy cows. We collected 90 maize kernel samples. 85 were collected across South Africa, and we had two from the Ukraine and two from Argentina, because we sometimes import maize from these countries. And then we also added popcorn in the sample set as an extreme vitreous sample. So that make up the 90 samples that we used. The objectives of the study were to find a rapid method that can be used in practice to measure maize hardness. Secondly, to develop a regression that can be used to predict KD of maize starch. Thirdly, to evaluate a commercial starch binder that could be used when high amounts of soft maize are included in dairy diets. So the methods that we used in objective one, first of all, uh, NIR uh, with a single absorbance at 2230 nanometers, and all 90 samples were um, used in that analysis. Secondly, we used a particle size index, or PSI, based in sieving through a 106 micron screen. Again, all 90 samples were used. We uh, used a rapid viscosity analyzer with 10 soft and 10 hard samples. We used the XCT and image analysis on 10 soft and 10 hard samples. Now, the XCT is our um, acronym for the X-ray microcomputed tomography scanning equipment. And this is uh, the pictures of the equipment you used. This is uh, the NIR that was used. And these are images from the X-ray scans. Um, the blue area is the maize germ. The red area is the hard endosperm. And the yellow area is the soft endosperm. So in the hard kernel, you can clearly see all the red there compared to the soft kernel where there's a lot of yellow. So the hard kernel, not too much soft endosperm. In the soft kernel, very clearly a much higher amount of soft endosperm. 
The NIR, the PSI and the XCT image analysis all correlated well and all could be used to determine a hardness index for maize. The XCT was believed to be the most accurate and was used as a reference for the other methods. As most feed mills use NIR technology, it was decided to base the rest of the study on the NIR hardness index values. So the methods that we used was that um, six of the 90 maize samples were selected for in vitro dry matter and starch disappearance values over 48 hours. The samples varied from very soft to very hard. So we looked at the whole set of samples and we tried to represent all, all over the, uh, the spectrum in our selection of these six samples. We did five in vitro runs in a temperature controlled room that is maintained between 39 and 41 degrees centigrade. The results were quite amazing. Um, well, one could expect that maybe, but these graphs really look nice. And if you look at the top one, the vitreous one maize was the softest one, and you can see how fast it fermented and how soon it plateaued or how soon it reached an asymptote, almost uh, after 15 hours, 15, 16, 18 hours. On the other extreme, the red line, the very hard maize, high vitreous maize, fermented much slower, and um, even after 40 hours, it was still fermenting a little bit, and with no surprise, this was the uh, the, the popcorn. Uh, but the clearly illustrates the effect of vitreousness on starch disappearance values. The uh, effect of this uh, vitreousness on some linear parameters and the predicted ruminal disappearance of starch, just look at these bold figures, KD, in the soft maze was 0.452, and in the hard maze it was 0.112. So as the vitreousness increased, KD clearly decreased. The same with predicted ruminal disappearance. With the soft maze it was 78.8, and it decreased gradually, stepwise, right down to 61.6%. We got... Um, very good quadrat quadratic regressions. R square was 0.95 for KD and 0.996 for predicted ruminal disappearance of starch. On the regression line, this is what it looked like. You can see the NIR hardest index from low, from zero to high, and the six May samples that we used lied very close to the line. The um, prediction of rumen disappearance or potential rumen disappearance of starch, all the data points were virtually on the line. This is an excellent regression fit. Then some maize samples were taken after harvest from farms. Uh, we secured a five ton batch of maize from a farm that had been identified to pr produce quite a soft maize. We took 10 kilogram samples from, uh, two 10 kilogram samples from this five ton batch. The one was milled through one millimeter using a laboratory mill, and the other one was milled through four millimeters using a hammer mill on the farm. Samples of both these uh, mazes were used in an in vitro star digestibility trial where the samples were treated with either distilled water or a starch binder, Bioprotect, and both treatments were equivalent to 10 liters per ton. The balance of the five ton batch of maize was hammer milled through four millimeters to be used in a total tract digestibility trial with six lactating cows in a, uh, actually a two by three crossover experiment. These were the results of the in vitro study. Very interesting. You can see the blue line is the maize that's been milled through one millimeter. So we'll just talk about the one millimeter maize compared to the four millimeter maize, the green lines. The solid line is the control, and the broken line is the bioprotect treatment. 
the same here with the green. And here there's not much, a slightly lower uh, starch disappearance in vitro of the, of the bioprotect versus the control. But for the four millimeter maize, we had a much significantly reduced starch disappearance in vitro when treated with bioprotect compared to the control. So this um, led to a trial with, with dairy cows. Um, but uh, yeah, let me first show you the KD values, 0 0.9, 0 0.198 uh, for the control. One and bioprotect one also 0.919 something. So the bioprotect and the control had virtually the same KDs, but in the coarser maze, in the four millimeter maze, the KD was significantly reduced when treated with the starch binder. The same with the predicted ruminal disappearance. Not much difference in the finely ground, ground maize, but in the coarsely ground maize, it was significantly reduced by the starch binder. And then, lastly, in the cow trial, we feed, fed them diets quite high in this uh, soft corn, and we treated uh, it with either distilled water or bioprotect, and just look at the bold figures here, the total tract starch digestibility decreased significantly. Total tract dry matter and nitrogen were not affected, but the starch digestibility was reduced by bioprotect treatment. So conclusions from these trials are that maize viruses vary across a wide spectrum. NIR can be used to determine maize vitreousness. NIR maize hardness index can be determined by feed molds and can be used as a rapid tool to predict KD and predicted rumen disappearance of starch. And that can be used to increase diet formulation accuracy. The starch binder can be used in the TMR to slow the rate of starch digestion in low vitreous maize. So when high amounts of low vitreous maize are used in dairy cow diets, we often get problems with subacute or even acute rumen acidosis. But when we use a starch binder, it could be useful to limit subacute rumen acidosis. I want to acknowledge First of all, Ag Model Systems for inviting me to participate in the webinar series. I'm truly honored. Then the Department of Animal Sciences, where I spent half of my research career. All my past and current postgraduate students that were involved in a variety of research projects. Regarding the buffer work that I showed you, I acknowledge my former PhD student, Tanya Carlitz, and MSc student Michelle Bea, and some of the data came from publications that we did together. Then I want to thank my recent PhD student Brink van Seil, who worked with me on the Vitreses trials. And all the data that I presented here on these trials came from his dissertation. Okay, by that, thanks again for listening. John, thank you. And I am going to take control for a second and progress through our introduction for our next um, speaker, which you referred so often to some of the work that Lance Baumgart has done. Um, our September speaker will be Dr. Lance Baumgart, a professor, um, an, a professor at Iowa State University. He is the Norman L. Jacobson Endowed Professor of Nutritional Physiology. Lance received his bachelor's and master's at the University of Minnesota with Dr. Brian Crooker and his PhD from Cornell University with our July speaker, Dr. Dale Bauman. With a 70% research and a 25% teaching appointment, Lance has numerous papers, abstracts, symposia presentations, and trade articles to his credit. He receives consistent high reviews for his lectures with quotes like, hilarious, awesome, 
amazing lectures balanced by tough grader and my favorite, skip class, you won't pass. Baumgard's primary research emphasis has been on the metabolic and endocrine consequences of heat stress in growing and lactating animals, and it will lead in very nicely to what um, Professor Kroywagen spoke of today. His talk will be Leaky Gut's Contribution to Heat Stress and Ketosis. We will be back on our routine time scheduling during um, starting the webinar at 6 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on September 13th. Always, I want to thank our generous sponsors and the people who help make this possible. Tom Taluki, AMTS USA and Global, Marcos Neves Piera, University of Lavras, Markel, Marcelo Hens Ramos at 3R Lab in Brazil, and they again did not join us this time. Paula Torillo in Argentina, and our translators in each location. We have generous sponsors that make it possible for us to get great speakers and manage the program. We thank our gold sponsor, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition through Amino Acids. Our silver sponsor, our Arm & Hammer Animal Nutrition, R&D Life Scientist, Virtus, makers of Stratus with EPA, DHA, Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s, Dairy One Forage Laboratory, and Dairy Land Laboratories. Our bronze sponsors are Jeffo, My Life Made Easier, Adiseo, Amino Max, and Quality Li Liquid Feeds. And we have to send a special thanks to Amino Max because um, Heinrich Spangenberg was one of the people who helped get um, Professor Croyragen with us. I'm going to open the floor up for questions um, for the English language listeners. Please type your questions either in the chat window or the question and answer window, and I will um, read them off to Professor Croywagen and Paula Torillo from Argentina will have questions that she can um, ask. I'm going to start with a question that I have in my window, um, and then I'll go to Paula. Paula has to do the extra step of translating them from Spanish into English before she asks the question. So I'll give her a little bit of a break. Um, Dr. Croywagen, you're not going to have much of a break. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, my first question is from Jim Aldrich. He says, isn't there quite a bit of variation in rumen pH based on location within the rumen reticulum? When talking about an average pH at a given time point, is it assumed that it's a composite of several different locations? Yes, that's an excellent question. And there's been a lot of debate around that. And yes, obviously, I'm quite sure there is a, quite a variation uh, depending on where you take the rumen samples for pH, it will differ in the reticulum from higher up in the rumen. Now, we have a, um, a setup in our pH logging that we do where the, uh, the, the logger itself resides outside of the, or just inside the cannula, but the probe, the electrode, is located in such a way, positioned in such a way that it's more or less in the center of the rumen. So it's not down at the bottom and it doesn't go up and down, it doesn't stay j just down. So we, I often uh, refer to that as right in the engine room of the, of the rumen. Um, yeah, that's where we take our rumen pH measurements, more or less in the center. But yeah, good question. It can obviously differ between different sites. So one should, if, if samples are taken by hand or even via loggers, you should specify if the logger was residing down at the bottom of the rumen or as in our case, it, um, it was kept, it was maintained in the center of the rumen. Does that answer the question? Um, I, I hope so, and if not, um, please, Jim, go ahead and, and write more in the window and we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, I have a question from Carl Cass, and he asks, with the onset of robotic herds and their use of a PMR instead of a TMR, 
do we ex and that's a partial um, mixed um, ration. Do we expect different requirements for PE and DF? I think the the, the PE and DF, in my mind, of my opinion, is that it is formulated per diet, um, and we know that if we do not have a good uh, particle size of a TMR, then you can get selection by cows and it's not, it doesn't stay in a mixed form. And then we also talk about the PMR. And in such cases, cows can select. So yes, where cows have the opportunity to select, then it can affect the, uh, the way we, we have to look at the formulation. As I also mentioned in the pasture-based cows, you know, they, they are on pasture day and night and they only get their concentrate twice. And that makes a, a big difference in the, uh, in the pH profile. So if the cows have access to various components of the feeds, then I think we should just make sure that they have uh, sufficiently coarse material in the diet. Uh, so I presume in this case that what, what he refers to is that cows have access to a concentrate feed and a, a forage separately. And that could pose the same problems than cows in a pasture, just not exactly the same, but maybe in a sense. And But still, I think the total ration should still adhere to NRC recommendations. Um, and maybe one should manage the cows such that they don't spend too much time on feeding the fine or the concentrate part alone. I don't have much experience in, in robotic feeding uh, or, or, or feeding in the robotic cows, but yeah, good question, but that's my answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and have Paula. I have a couple more questions, but I'm going to take turns with Paula, so I'm going to let her ask a few questions. Um, go ahead, Paula. Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Christian. I have a couple of questions here from Argentina. Uh, question number one, uh, it's from Daniel. In Argentina, it is normal to, in some systems, to raise alfalfa, offering a partial mixed ration twice a day and a commercial feed twice a day also during milkings. What pattern would you expect in room and pH in those cases? Okay. I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. So he says that apart from the TMR that they receive, they also receive additional alfalfa and concentrate. Is that right? During times of milking? They graze alfalfa, they eat during milking, and they also are fed with a PMR, a partial mixed ration. Okay. So they are eating alfalfa hay during the day, they receive a PMR, and then they are fed a concentrate mix at the dairy in the past. Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I would, I would expect the more pH fluctuations in such a case because the more constant, it depends on the amount of, of uh, concentrate that they feed them in the parlor. If it's just a, a, a very small amount, then it shouldn't make too much of a difference. But if it's a significant amount, then I would expect the pH to drop quite significantly in the hours after milking. Um, I don't know, does, do they say if they uh, experience occasional problems with uh, SARA or something like that? Uh, but yeah, sure, I would expect that if that's the only place where the concentrate is being fed, then you could assume a similar type of pH profile that I showed you in the uh, pasture trials that we did, in the, the second one with the lush pastures. Okay. Yes, perfect. Uh, question number two, uh, this is from Elvio. Knowing that pKa of bicarb is 6.78, what, what is the effectiveness of this additive under a low pH? Uh, what would be the? Uh, the? The question is, 
if it works, if you expect the bicarb to work uh, well under a acidotic condition. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a bicarb is a good buffer, but it dissolves um, um, uh, more quickly than other, like for example, for like the um, um, marine algae. So the um, the effect doesn't last that long, uh, depending on how often the cows eat. So if it is in a TMR at a certain rate, then it should work quite well under acidotic conditions. But we found that um, absolutely it works better than no buffer, for sure. But there are uh, buffers like the marine algae that, that work even better. I don't know if that answers the question, but it will definitely have an effect, a beneficial effect uh, on acidotic type of diets, for sure. Is that, does that answer the question? I, I think it does. I will ask uh, Elvio. Okay, uh, I have a, the third question uh, is, uh, what is the cause of different rumen pH in animals eating the same diet? Is the animal with the lowest pH in a worse health state than the other animal? No, not necessarily. That is a very interesting question because we often see cows that just have a low pH and they, they milk very well, they don't have acidosis, they have no uh, laminitis and no problems. Uh, so it's not necessarily that all the cows, if it is a low pH cow, the cow might be a little bit more adapted to those conditions. What affects it is unsure. I'm not sure why, but as the, the trials that Paul Weimer did, uh, the cows were on a, exactly the same diet conditions and our, we also had trials like that same diet same conditions everything the same but the one cow just has a lower ph than the than the other cows and sometimes uh, you also get cows that have chronic acidosis uh, on the same diet than others and it could be because they are low ph cows or it could be that they sort their feeds more or other uh, type of con conditions but um, what exactly, as Paul says, the cow is able to control her own chemistry. How they do it, I don't know. But uh, on the same diet, you get low pH cows and you get high pH cows. And the low pH cows do not necessarily have more health problems. Uh, there is a tendency, of course, with pH going down, uh, that the, the, the cow can get acidosis. But yes, cows definitely differ and also d differ in their response. Some will show as doses, some won't. Okay, perfect. I have a question from Scott Davil. Does pH bounce back fast, faster the lower it drops? Also, how, does pH, how do pH drops appear for TMR herds? Does it go up? Quickly after it dropped, it depends on, on the diet, it depends on the PENDF, it dep depends on the feeding frequency, and so on. But what we find, usually see in the typical um, rumen pH profile is that after feeding, the pH usually drops and then it gradually increases. So it usually doesn't increase as fast as it drops. Uh, and what was the second part of the question? Um, TMR. Let's see. Also, how do P how do pH drops appear for TMR herds? Yeah, it's um, the pH drops are more gradual in TMR. If if it's a good TMR with a um, well defined PENDF, then the pH also drops, but not as fast as in a uh, diet where you feed forage and concentrate separately. So in a TMR you also get the typical uh, diurnal profile of quite high in the morning, it drops after feeding, gradually increases a bit, drops after the following feeding and then reaches a nadir late at night and then gradually increases 
during the night and early morning hours until uh, the early morning feeding. So for a for a TMR, it is <laughs> you know you cannot really generalize. It depends on 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 the qualities of the TMR. But for a well formulated TMR with a PENDF of about 24, 25 percent, the decreases is less significant than where the PENDF is 20 or 21 percent. So it, it all depends. The better the diet is formulated, the more gradual the, uh, or the narrower the uh, range will be for pH drop from high to low. Does that make sense? Does it answer the question? I, I, th I think it does. <laughs> I think, um, I think mm -hmm. he was looking for how much of a swing, um, and I think you got that. Um, I have a question from Mariska Bartlett, who um, did some work over here, but now she's back in South Africa. Um, mm -hmm. Seeing that we do push cows to their limits with high starch diets, driving production in modern dairies, do you think it is then not essential to add a live yeast like Luvacell SC to the diet to maintain a healthy rumen? Well, all these um, direct fed microbials have a place and they can certainly help to control pH. Yes, buffers direct fit microbials, including yeast cells. Uh, yeast have a marked effect on pH. So it, it, it can definitely be beneficial. And as she says, these days we're just pushing cows almost beyond their limits. And in my introduction, when I mentioned the, what the cow was made for, or how it was made, how, it, how evolution took, how it developed, you know, it's it's really we we uh, <laughs> we we're starting to feed cows really beyond the limits of their creation. So we have to add all these um, supplements. Uh, uh, well, not supplements, but let's say all the uh, the, the different aids, you know, buffers and um, yeast cells and so on. So yes, to answer the question, it can definitely help. Okay. Um, I have a question from Junichiro Ishii. How about the effect of bioprotection on um, on rumen acidosis to bypass the rumen, or on colon acidosis? To bypass rumen means to activate lower digestive tract fermentation, doesn't it? Mm. Interesting question. So in other words, what he asks is if we use uh, something like a, a starch binder, that, that uh, prevents or that slows down the fermentation in the rumen, uh, but he asks what happens in the hindgut. Is mm -hmm. that, do I understand the question correctly? Yes, yes, I believe well, that's what he's looking yeah, at. Yeah. I think uh, the same will happen in the hindgut if it's, if, it's, um, um, if it's protected from microbial digestion in the rumen, it will also be protected from microbial fermentation in the hindgut. That's, that's okay. my opinion. All right, thank you. And then I have one more I'm going to ask, and then I know Paula has a couple more. Um, this is from Jose Maurizio um, Dos Santos Neto. Which feedstuff would have more of a chance to cause, Sarah, a rapidly degraded carbohydrate like pectin or a carbohydrate prone to generate lactic acid like starch? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it also depends on the rest of the diet, the physical effect of fiber, the total microbial composition in, in the rumen as a result of the, of the PEF. But as soon uh, anything that stimulates lactic acid production just increases the chances of SARA because lactic acid is 10 times as potent as other, uh, as the volatile fatty acids. So whatever stimulates, uh, stimulates um, lactic acid production will just escalate the chances of SARA. Okay, thank you. I'm going to let Paula ask a few questions. I have some more questions, but we'll come back to me. Go ahead, Paula. Okay, I have a question from Uruguay. It's from Eduardo. What would be your recommended PE-NDF as a percentage of total NDF 
when grazing lush rye grass during late winter or early spring? Well, that's an interesting question. As I said, pasture-based cows have their own set of problems, but still stick to the recommendations and try to go for at least 21-22% PENDF. Uh, so sometimes what, what, um, what we have seen is that uh, in, in, uh, in some trials that we did, we feed high fiber concentrates. Like instead of starch, we add um, wheat bran, um, soybean hulls, uh, things like that that ferment slower, but also uh, add to the, the, the energy content of, the, of the, uh, the, the, the supplement. For example, uh, dried citrus pulp or dried apple pulp as well. We did a very interesting trial with, um, with cows with, with beef cows on pasture, where we uh, replaced all the starch in one diet with dried apple pulp. And we got amazing, uh, those cows had, uh, we didn't measure rumen pH, unfortunately, we the, uh, were not um, able to do that because this was just a beef production study, but we saw much less of um, uh, soft, watery uh, manure and uh, much higher um, growth rate. So we think that it was it, it had to do with the rate of fermentation of these different um, carbohydrates. Uh, but yes, to uh, to come back to the question, stick to the normal guidelines for PENDF in the total diet. And it is it's difficult to do it on lush pastures. And often farmers feed additional and uh, yeah, sorry, I'm interrupting myself. Uh, uh, Farmers sometimes feed additional dry forage on pastures for a few reasons. The first one is in last pastures, it is often different, difficult to get a good dry matter intake. And secondly, the pasture uh, is, is too, too little. For, for instance, in our country right now, it is quite dry. There just isn't enough pasture, so farmers supplement the pasture with dry forages. And that results in um, uh, better dry matter intakes and uh, also higher butter fat. So I think in cases where it is uh, difficult in winter and so on and with less pastures when it's really wet, uh, it's difficult to meet. The, it's easy for me to say, oh, I'll just go for the higher PENDF. But sometimes you have to add dry forage or include high fiber concentrates. To, to overcome that problem. So it's, it's a very good question and it's a very <laughs> uh, significant problem that we sometimes have. Okay, and regarding this question, um, Eduardo added, which is the effectiveness of this white grass and the F? What is the effectiveness of that rye grass? And the F. Yes, it depends on the growth stage, uh, how long after a previous grazing and in exact time of the year, but uh, the effectiveness is very often quite low. I cannot give you a, a, a figure, I, I don't have that on the top of my head, but it can be quite low, the effectiveness of the NDF in, in the rye grass, depending on the sea. We've seen that for a small time window, let's say for about a, a month, the, the, the PENDF of the effectiveness of the fiber is very low. And then as the pasture gets older and we go into spring and so on, then we get much less problems. So there's a, there's a small time window where the effectiveness, is, effectiveness of that ryegrass NDF is quite low. Very okay. low actually. Perfect. And the last question uh, is from Pedro in Argentina. Uh, during acidotic episodes you showed us, did you also find a flip in solid composition? Did we notice uh, uh, what in solid composition? 
a drop in, in milk solids? A flip, a, a change uh, in protein to butter composition in milk. Yes. As the, as the pH drops, usually the protein to, um, to fat increases. In other words, there's less fat in relation to protein. Does that answer the question? Yes, I think so. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes. Yeah, good, good. <laughs> um, I have a question from Mohammed Lassi in Iran. In my country, farmers use sodium bicarbonate in the rations and separately in the feed bunk because they say that cows can balance themselves if they need more buffer. Do you have the same idea and do you recommend that? <laughs> no, I don't recommend that. I don't. Um, I don't think so. It's. It. it uh, I'm not aware of that. So, in my opinion, these, uh, uh, where they recommend that you put out minerals and everything, and the cow will will look after itself as it thinks it needs it. I don't think so. I don't think the cow feels well. I need some more bicarb now because I feel acidosis is coming. Uh, so the short answer is no, I don't share that opinion. Okay. Um, I have a very poorly formed question because this is coming from me. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding is perhaps jerseys require more or respond well or require more bicarb than Holsteins. Is that something that's just sort of a wives' tale or an old nutritionist tale? You know, that's a very interesting question. I don't think so, Marion. Um, jerseys are excellent grazers. And um, we did a trial long ago where we compared jerseys to Holsteins in terms of um, rumen fermentation and pH and everything. And we found that the, the pH in the jerseys just didn't go so low as those in, in, in the Holsteins on the same diet. Hmm. Um, so I'm, I, I think I will differ in that um, remark that, you know, that the Jerseys need more PE and if I don't think so. I think they are excellent grazers and they are capable of, of dealing quite well with, um, with the conditions on pastures. Okay. Well, anybody that's listened to this and attended has probably picked up that I have a very strong Jersey bias. Um, <laughs> I always ask questions about jerseys. Paula has no more questions, and I am out of questions in all of my windows, so um, I think that gets you off the hook. I want to thank you again for such a great, um, such a great presentation. And it looks like I've lost you. Um, no, no, I'm here. I'm still oh, okay. Here. For some reason, I'm just listening. you went out of my screen. Um, uh, okay. Very strange. Anyway, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. Um, it was nice to, to do it in the middle of the day for us, rather at the end, and it's at the end of the day for you. So, um, yes. And, and everybody yes. should attend to the next webinar, which will probably address some of these issues um, additionally. So. Okay. Well, thank you, Marion, um, and thank you, AMTS, for this opportunity. I really enjoyed it, and as I said, it's I'm really honoured to be to have been part of this. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, and Tom was with us for a brief time. He he said he got dumped. So, um, uh, okay. <laughs> I, he he I saw that he was on there for a little while. Um, he probably got dumped when he saw his picture on one of the. Stories. He might have. He might have just run away. <laughs> but I love that picture. <laughs> I have ways of saving it now. Okay. <laughs> well, thank okay. you so much, and um, you have a good good evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, and have a nice day. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye bye.